Johnny Mercer, backbench Conservative MP, tipped as a possible future party leader. A former soldier who fought in Afghanistan more than once. And now one of a handful of Tory MPs taking on the Prime Minister on universal credit. Mr Mercer, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Noel. Let's start, shall we, with, 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 with universal credit. It has uh, proved to be something of a thorn in the government side for, for some time now, and it appears to be building to a head. I mean, simply put, what are your concerns with the scheme? Well, look, my, my concerns have always been the same, really. I think um, universal credit as a poverty-fighting tool is really important in places like Plymouth, where the benefits culture has you know, transformed our city. It's really taken away ambition and um, you know, opportunities for young people. Universal credit is going to tackle that, but we've just got to be so careful about how it comes in. Um, there are a couple of key areas that I've been concerned around, and I, you know, I haven't changed my tune on that. I think the phone number was um, you know, a bit of an error, really. Um, and the seven-day wait that's, that's built in, making it six weeks before someone gets their first payment, I think is, it is quite difficult to ask people to do. I mean, the, the, the Prime Minister was asked of her assessment of, of, of whether or not the system was correct. This is what she had to say. In her words, it's a system that is working. I yeah, mean, she's absolutely right. Demonstrably, that's not the case. Well, I mean, it, it, a, a it fifth, is. A fifth of people do not receive their money within that six. So, if you look at if you look at the statistics from where this has been rolled out, and absolutely granted that these are around single people living on their own, it's a less complicated scenario. It is working in terms of um, in terms of you know getting people into work, which is what this is about. The single biggest factor in improving life chances in vulnerable people is getting people into work. So it is working. There are areas where it could work better, and the government's listening on this. You know, um, well, same day advances point, and things like that is important. Listen, the government is listening. I mean, you you, you went to see the, the the prime minister about this. You'd been quite vocal about your concerns about the system, the rollout of universal credit. You had that meeting. And you seem to be a bit more sanguine about it today. I mean, what, what concessions did the Prime Minister offer? Look, no, that was a private meeting with the Prime Minister. I'm not going to go into that. My, but it's fair my, to say that she offered you something. No, it's not fair to say that. I had a conversation with the Prime Minister, and that's a private conversation. My concerns around this have always been the same, around the two, particularly the two issues I've just mentioned to you there. Um, and yes, you know, we, we have seen movement on the phone line, which is good. Um, we may see movement on four to six weeks. No one's given me that steer. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is a modern, compassionate Conservative Party that wants to get these things right. It's not sort of fingers in the ear time and just, just crack on with it. Uh, the government is listening. You know, David Gork um, and Damien have, you know, we've done a lot of work on this. They are listening. Same day advances coming out. The system is changing as we roll it out. But what we mustn't do is stop it going, because this is going to be the single biggest tool in fighting poverty in constituencies like mine. I mean, well, let's deal with that, that, that 0345 number. Yeah, we are told now by the end of the month that that will be a thing of the past. But what, what strikes me is that somewhere in Whitehall, there is a minister that signed off on that. I, I think it's a little bit unfair because I think a lot of the phone numbers are like that. I don't think there is a minister who sat there and gone, yes, this is a particularly good idea. If you're on the phone they, they for 40 minutes... They should have, though, shouldn't they? You know, well, a, yes, a but there's a lot, there's a lot that goes on. I think, you know, universal these credit. Things, yeah, these, well, it's actually the same as other phone lines to deal with other issues and the same uh, rates that you would have to phone your local MP for a surgery appointment. So let's not pretend it's some great conspiracy. Um, it's something that should have been corrected. It has been corrected. Um, and that's, you know, that's what the government does in my experience. I've only been there two years, but it's not, it's not an effort to sort of just implement a policy that's going to have a bad effect on the country. They want to get this right. David Gork is working really hard to get this right. And we've got to be honest and give them credit for that and actually go with the programme. If you disagree with the, the 0345 number for, for universal credit, you should presumably then disagree with it elsewhere in government. Well, I think that, um, you know, these lines that, uh, that, that we're asking people, particularly around the DWP, to, to get in touch and, uh, and try and correct issues with their benefits, you know, these are really vulnerable people for whom, you know, they'll be on uh, uh, pay-as-you-go contracts. They're not going to have access to uh, free phone calls. Yeah, we've got to think a bit more carefully around that. Absolutely. But, you know, is this a deliberate sort of attempt to make people pay to get in touch with DWP? I think that's a bit far-fetched. Uh, but, but just going, sticking on this topic of universal credit, I mean, as you say, there, is concern, there are concerns about the, the month in arrears. There are concerns about the, the, the week waiting period. There are concerns that people are not being made aware of the fact that you know, funds can be made in advance if, if they are necessary. I mean, you know, we're not talking about a pilot of you know, changing policemen's helmets yellow or you know, uh, changing the speed limit on you know, roadworks and motorways. We're mm. talking about a system that, in essence, if it doesn't work, 
takes food out of the mouths of children. So, so what reassurances did you receive from the Prime Minister in your meeting that the system can oh, move look, forward? Look, I'm not going to change my tune on this. It's a private meeting with the Prime Minister and we're not going to go into that. Well, on behalf but of this your is... constituents who've raised the concerns, what reassurances have you received from the Prime Minister that this system... Well, again, I'm not going to talk about a conversation with the Prime Minister. I'm confident that this government is listening. If they weren't, I would say something about it. If, uh, if um, the government wasn't working hard to make these adjustments, to make this actually work... Um, I would say something about it, but that's not the case. And they have moved on this stuff. We've got to deal with this in the realms of reality. They have introduced even same-day advances for those who have no money whatsoever. So this policy is changing, but we cannot stop it. We've got to introduce it because ultimately it's improving lives in constituencies like mine. Had the universal credit now not, not reared its ugly head, I, I presume many people would have actually thought this to be a, a, a pretty good week for the Prime Minister in terms of uh, the noises emerging from Brussels on Brexit. I mean, are you pleased with the way the negotiations are going? Uh, I don't particularly take a view on the negotiations because I'm not one of these who thinks we should sort of comment on everything that happens, actually. I think I'm, I'm noticing we have, I'm noticing OK, that. we have... Um, we're going through Brexit, a really, really difficult process. Um, we've got to get it right. But, you know, and so whilst I subscribe to this idea, you can't go out trying to get a no deal, right? There's no point going in and saying, look, we're happy to take whatever comes because um, we're leaving anyway. At the end of the day, the Prime Minister, David Davis, Boris and the team, they've got a responsibility to get a deal for people who voted for Brexit. That's the key. People voted for this vision and we have to deliver that. Um, and I think we should back the Prime Minister and get on with it rather than picking at the bones all the time. I mean, would, would you vote against a, a, a no-deal Brexit? I mean, would you vote with the Labour Party to ensure that the Commons gets a, a final say on the deal? No, I wouldn't. I would, uh, I would vote, you know, the, the UK has voted to lead the European Union. You know, uh, I think one of the things that got me into politics is that we treat, you know, I did feel like we treated people like they were stupid previously. And now people are saying, well, they didn't know what they were voting for. They did know what they were voting for. You can't have a referendum and then go back on it. We now have to unite as one team and deliver on that promise of leaving the European Union and go on to what the Conservative Party stands for afterwards. That's what people people want. You know, they want to know how we're going to fund the House Service. They want to know how we're going to increase the life chance of our most vulnerable in constituencies like Plymouth. And, you know, whilst Brexit drowns it all out, I'm afraid, that's not what people want from politics. Um, and we've got to do better. Actually, talking about the, reason that, the, the reasons behind your, your move into politics, I mean, you said once that you, you got fed up with the difference between what people say in the Commons and the platitudes that come out on, on Remembrance Day. I mean, arguably, as regards our armed forces. I mean, things have gotten worse since you got into politics. Well, I don't think they've got worse. I think it, it's a journey. I make no bones about it. We're not where I want to be. Um, I've worked extremely hard on the veterans piece. And actually, there are people who work day in, day out uh, in veterans care trying to get this right. And yes, I feel the government could have and should have done more. Uh, but, you know, events have kind of overtaken us in that way. And Brexit dominates the bandwidth. And I get that. Um, but we need to talk about as a party what we look like after Brexit. And I hope the veterans care and you know, being a party of defence means something. Well, well, on the claim to be a party of defence, I mean, I mean, do you consider the Conservatives to be bound by their manifesto commitment to increase defence spending above inflation? Yes, I do. I saw uh, Michael Fallon last week and he mentioned that again. I don't expect that to change. That is a commitment that people voted for the Conservative Party. And look, this 2% argument, now is a bit of a, uh, a herring in the wind, really, because you can't just get a, a level of GDP spent to it and then think everything's all right. It's got to be done around capability. Well, well I, mean, I, I mean, Sir Michael has, has suggested that now is the time for us to see your spending Absolutely. rise above the 2% level. But, you know, we learned from the Sunday Telegraph's Ben Farmer this morning, the Treasury is blocking the manifesto commitment to increase spending uh, above inflation. Now, if that were to happen, I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty fundamental failure, isn't it, on the part of the party to live up to commitments? Look, that's not something I'm going to support. People voted for a Conservative government, and part of that was um, a 0.5% increase above inflation. We need to see that because I think defence spending is too low. I think if you look at uh, both the threats that we're currently facing, which by Michael's own admission have, have developed significantly in the last two years, and Brexit, what the UK looks like after Brexit, there is an increased role for our armed forces and we've got to fund it. I mean, things have changed somewhat since your day. I mean, back then there were real concerns about kit. Those are, are certainly not to the same extent that they, that they once were, but the, the, the concern appears to be the number of people that we actually have in uniform at the moment. Yeah, but again, numbers is a bit of a red herring. It's about capabilities, right, and what people can do and what we can ask people the, the, to the do. The two are linked. No, no, they are linked, but they're also not linked. So you've got the technology and what we can enable people to do. You look at these Type 26 uh, frigates. Yes, we've got less of them, but they're infinitely more capable. And actually, you know, we've got to have an educated debate around this. It's got to be about capabilities, what we can achieve, how far we can project our forces, 
But we've got to ask what we want from our armed forces as a country, and crucially what we don't want, and that's what we haven't had a discussion about. Still, uh, you of all people know the, <clears throat> the significance of the chain of command, of following orders. I mean, what would you think of a leader that, that tolerated open insurrection, that, where, where, where her orders weren't followed? You yes, might no, notice I, I, I used the feminine there. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't really buy into that, because, look, Brexit is an enormously difficult thing, and I actually think every government needs someone like Philip Hamill in the Treasury, someone like Boris who's got a view, someone like Theresa keeping her hand on the tiller. The answer is probably somewhere in the middle. I'm, I haven't got a problem with it. I do think, you know, I would suggest that, uh, you know, working as a team is the only way we're going to solve this particular team uh, requires challenge. leaders, though, doesn't a it? A team does require leaders, and Theresa's doing a good job. And the EU is the enemy? No, <laughs> he's not the enemy. Uh, well, how do you view it then? I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but in the sense that, you know, we have Theresa May at the moment struggling to, uh, to keep a lid on, you know, some members of the cabinet. I'm sure she would prefer them to be quiet from time to time. I mean, the characterisation of the EU as the enemy may not be your view, but the characterisation of you know, some of the people sitting around the cabinet table as her enemy, I mean, it's, it's demonstrably true. Uh, I don't think it's demonstrably true. I would say, in fairness, I think, you know, in, in organisations where I've worked before, you know, the teamwork is, uh, has been uh, something that I found particularly lacking and particularly disappointing, actually. I think when your leader has a particularly difficult time, um, actually, that's when you become more resilient, more disciplined. You work harder as a team to achieve the outcome you're trying to do. You know, at the end of the day, we're sent here by people who voted for us to get an outcome. It's not about us and the sort of dynamics going on within the, uh, within the cabinet. So, yes, no, I, I accept what you're saying on that front. But uh, I think Theresa is a good prime minister. And look, we need to get on, deliver Brexit. That is what people want on the doors in places like Plymouth. We need to deliver that and then get on to what being in the Conservative Party actually means beyond that. Do you aspire? To lead. I mean, there are many who suggest that we should perhaps skip a generation in the Conservative Party. I've got a very busy seat down in uh, Plymouth, and uh, I'm, I, I like getting on with that. Thanks, Noel. I'm sure you do indeed, uh, Johnny Mercer. Many thanks for being with us.